Here at Penn State, the meteorology and geography departments share the same building, and many geographers do research that relates heavily to atmospheric science. Dr. Andrew Carlton is a distinguished member of Penn State's Department of Geography with research ties to many aspects of climate science. The climatology of jet contrails is one of them. We also study uh, initially on a, on a weather time scale. We use satellite data to identify them, um, uh, their occurrences, and to map them, plot them in GIS. Um, but then uh, we also look at them on a climate time scale, so on periods of multiple weeks to several months. Um, so you can identify where are the characteristic places in the United States that contrails tend to occur. Contrails develop when water vapor condenses and freezes around small particles that exist in the atmosphere and in aircraft exhaust. Contrails sustaining themselves then depend largely on the temperature and moisture profile at the altitude at which the aircraft is flying. So some areas of the country are more likely to see contrails than others. Uh, and we find that um, on average, most contrails develop over the Midwestern U.S., extending into the Northeast and also into the, the Southeast. Um, the intermountain areas um, of, say, Nevada and Utah don't tend to see many of them, and that's probably because the atmosphere is not really moist enough to generate them. So we like to, to plot where they're occurring, describe their climatology, and then relate their, where they occur and the variations seasonally and annually um, in connection with the upper troposphere circulation. So where are the jet streams located? Where are the, uh, the troughs and the ridges located or the anomalies in a particular month? For the average human being, walking out and seeing a jet contrail is nothing more than a thin cloud high in the sky. But to a climatologist, this is an area of intrigue as these thin clouds can have a big weather and climate effect going forward in ways that you may not expect. The results of our studies are pretty conclusively that they reduce the diurnal temperature range in places where they occur frequently, again, like, like the Midwest. So what that means is, is that uh, where you have a lot of contrails, the daytime high temperature is a little bit lower than it would be in clear sky conditions because there's not quite so much solar energy reaching the ground. And at nighttime, they tend to trap the long wave energy, and so they keep the temperatures raised more than, than if the sky was clear. So that reduces the, the daily temperature range, and that occurs pretty consistently um, across regions wherever you have large numbers of contrails. When thinking about the effects that clouds would have on the weather and climate, Dr. Carlton thinks that precipitation patterns could also be affected by jet contrails. Uh, what we're currently looking at uh, and hope to in the future is to um, assess, do contrails have an impact on how much precipitation falls? If you get contrails occurring, say, in frontal systems, do, they, do the ice crystals from the contrails potentially seed the lower level clouds and increase the possibility of precipitation? It's been suggested many times over the years that this is what happens, but no one's really looked at it in, uh, in detail. Um, and so that's something that we are planning, planning on doing next. So there is still plenty to learn about how contrails can affect day-to-day -day weather patterns. However, simply looking at the trends, a warmer atmosphere holds more water vapor. And given that contrails need adequate high-level moisture to form and sustain themselves... That that would mean that we could get more contrails um, in, in the future because the conditions would be uh, m even more susceptible for contrails to occur. Going forward, it is still a little too early to determine if certain geographic regions could have their climate impacted by contrails. However, using satellite climatology over the last several decades, the contrail patterns across the country reveal that the jet stream position has a lot to do with it. The, the differences seem to relate to the teleconnection patterns again, um, such as the Arctic Oscillation. Um, that affects the, the United States. But so it's not clear yet whether there is a, a what we will consider a longer term climate impact on contrail. Now Earth's atmosphere has a budget, an energy balance, different features that regulate just how much solar radiation hits the ground on any given day. And clouds play a huge role 
in that energy balance. If you study clouds, and contrails are a form of clouds, they potentially uh, could change that, that equation, uh, depending on what kinds of clouds form. So that the warming may not be as large as what you anticipate, or if it's, if it's high-level clouds, it could be greater than what you, what you anticipate. And in such a vast scientific field, it is always important to remember. And, and only when you have really a baseline of what, what has been going on climatologically can you even begin to make possible scenarios of, of what might happen in, in the future. This is one example of just how much of a treasure trove of information our atmosphere contains that we continue to learn from each and every day. The sky is the limit. For Weatherworld, I'm Ben Reppert.